Section 15 of Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 23rd January 1645. We went without the walls of the city to visit St Paul's, to which place it is said the Apostle bore his own head after Nero had caused it to be cut off. The church was founded by the great Constantine. The main roof is supported by one hundred vast columns of marble, and the mosaic work of the great arch is wrought with a very ancient story of AD A440, as is likewise that of the Facciata. The gates are brass, made at Constantinople in 1070, as you may read by those Greek verses engraven on them. The church is near 500 feet long and 258 in breadth, and has five great aisles joined to it, on the basis of one of whose columns is this odd title, Fle Eugenius Acellus C.C. Pruff Orbis V.S. 1 Reparavit. Here they showed us that miraculous crucifix which they say spake to St. Bridget, and just before the Ciborio stand two excellent statues. Here are buried part of the bodies of St. Paul and St. Peter. The pavement is richly interwoven with precious oriental marbles above the high altar, where are also four excellent paintings, whereof one, representing the stoning of St. Stephen, is by the hand of a Bolognian lady named Lavinia. The tabernacle on this altar is of excellent architecture, and the pictures in the chapel del Sacramento are of Lanfranco. Diverse other relics there be also in this venerable church, as a part of St. Anna, the head of the woman of Samaria, the chain which bound St. Paul, and the aculeus used in tormenting the primitive Christians. The church stands in the Via Rositensis, about a mile from the walls of the city, separated from many buildings near it, except the Trie Fontana, to which, leaving our coach, we walked, going over the mountain, or little rising, upon which story says a hundred seventy and four thousand Christians had been martyred by Maximianus Diocletian and other bloody tyrants. On this stand St. Vincent's and St. Anastasius. Likewise the church of St. Maria Scalia Dolciello, in whose tribuna is a very fair mosaic work. The church of the Trio Fontana, as they are called, is perfectly well built, though but small, whereas that of St. Paul is but Gothic, having a noble cupola in the middle. In this they show the pillar to which St. Paul was bound when his head was cut off, and from whence it made three prodigious leaps, where there immediately broke out the three remaining fountains, which give denomination to this church. The waters are reported to be medicinal. Over each is erected an altar and a chained ladle for better tasting of the waters. That most excellent picture of St. Peter's crucifixion is of Guido. 25th January 1645 I went again to the Palazzo Farnese to see some certain statues and antiquities which by reason of the major domo not being within I could not formally obtain. In the hall stands that triumphant colossa of one of the family upon three figures, a modern but rare piece. About it stood some gladiators and at the entrance into one of the first chambers are two cumbent figures of age and youth brought hither from St. Peter's to make room for the Longinus under the cupola. Here was the statue of a ram running at a man on horseback, a most incomparable expression of fury, cut in stone, and a table of Pietra Comessa, very curious. The next chamber was all painted a fresco by a rare hand, as was the carving in wood of the ceiling, which, as I remember, was in cedar, as the Italian mode is, and not poor plaster, as ours are, some of the most richly gilt. In a third room stood the famous Venus and the child Hercules strangling a serpent, of Corinthian brass, antique, 
on a very curious basso relievo, the sacrifice to Priapus, the Egyptian Isis in the hard black ophite stone taken out of the Pantheon, greatly celebrated by the antiquaries. Likewise two tables of brass containing diverse old Roman laws. At another side of this chamber was the statue of a wounded Amazon falling from her horse, worthy the name of the excellent sculptor, whoever the artist was. Near this was a bas relievo of a bacchanalia, with the most curious Selenus. The fourth room was totally environed with statues. Especially observable was that so renowned piece of a Venus looking backward over her shoulder, and divers other naked figures by the old Greek masters. Over the doors are two Venuses, one of them looking on her face in a glass by Michelangelo. The other is painted by Caracci. I never saw finer faces, especially that under the mask, whose beauty and art are not to be described by words. The next chamber is also full of statues, most of them the heads of philosophers, very antique. One of the Caesars and another of Hannibal cost 1,200 crowns. Now I had a second view of that never-to-be-sufficiently admired gallery, painted in deep relievo, the work of ten years' study, for a trifling reward. In the wardrobe above they showed us fine wrought plate porcelain mazes of beaten and solid gold, set with diamonds, rubies and emeralds. A treasure, especially the workmanship, considered of inestimable value. This is all the Duke of Palmer's. Nothing seemed to be more curious and rare in its kind than the complete service of the purest crystal, for the altar of the chapel, the very bell, cover of a book, sprinkler, etc., were all of the rock, incomparably sculptured, with the holy story in deep levati. Thus was also wrought the crucifix, chalice, vases, flower-pots, the largest and purest crystal that my eyes have ever beheld. Truly I looked on this as one of the greatest curiosities I had seen in Rome. In another part were presses furnished with antique arms, German clocks, perpetual motions, watches, and curiosities of Indian works. A very ancient picture of Pope Eugenius, a St. Bernard, and a head of marble found long since, supposed to be a true portrait of our blessed Saviour's face. Hence we went to see Dr. Gibbs, a famous poet and countryman of ours, who had some intendancy in a hospital built on the Via Triumphalis, called Christ's Hospital, which he showed us. The infirmary, where the sick lay, was paved with various coloured marbles, and the walls hung with noble pieces. The bears are very fair. In the middle is a stately cupola, under which is an altar decked with diverse marble statues, all in sight of the sick, who may both see and hear mass as they lie in their beds. The organs are very fine and frequently played on to recreate the people in pain. To this joins an apartment destined for the orphans, and there is a school. The children wear blue, like ours in London, at an hospital of the same appellation. Here are forty nurses who give suck to such children as are accidentally found exposed and abandoned. In another quarter are children of a bigger growth, 450 in number, who are taught letters. In another, 500 girls under the tuition of diverse religious matrons in a monastery, as it were, by itself. I was assured that there were at least 2,000 more maintained in other places. I think one apartment had in it near 1,000 beds. These were in a very long room, having an inner passage for those who attend, with as much care, sweetness and conveniency as can be imagined, the Italians being generally very neat. Under the portico the sick may walk out and take the air. Opposite to this are other chambers, for such as are sick of maladies of a more rare and difficult cure, and they have rooms apart. At the end of the long corridor is an apothecary's shop, fair and very well stored, near which are chambers for persons of better quality who are yet necessitous. 
whatever the poor bring, is that they are coming in delivered to a treasurer who makes an inventory and is accountable to them or their representatives if they die. To this building joins the house of the commendator, who, with his officers attending the sick, make up ninety persons. Besides a convent and an ample church for the friars and priests who daily attend. The church is extremely neat and the sacristia is very rich. Indeed, it is altogether one of the most pious and worthy foundations I ever saw. Nor is the benefit small which divers young physicians and chirurgians reap by the experience they learn here among the sick, to whom those students have free access. Hence we ascended a very steep hill near the port San Pancratio to that stately fountain called Aqua Paola, being the aqueduct which Augustus had brought to Rome, now re-edified by Paulus V, a rare piece of architecture, and which serves the city after a journey of thirty-five miles, here pouring itself into diverse ample lavers out of the mouths of swans and dragons, the arms of this pope. Situate on a very high mount, it makes a most glorious show to the city, especially when the sun darts on the water as it gusheth out. The inscriptions on it are Paulus V, Romanus Pontifex, Opt Max, Aqueductus, Ab Augusto, Caesare, Extructos, Uvi Longiqua, Vetustate, Collapsos, in ampliorem formam restituate anno salutis, MDC 1X Pont 5th. And towards the fields, Paulus V Rome, Pontifex Optimus Maximus, Priori Ductu Longissimi, Temporis Injuria Pene de Ruto Sublimiorem. Thence to Velletri, a town heretofore of the Volsci, where is a public and fair statue of Pope Urban the Eighth in brass, and a stately fountain in the street. Here we lay and drank excellent wine. 28th January 1645 We dined at Sermonetta, descending all this morning down a stony mountain, unpleasant, yet full of olive trees, and anon pass a tower built on a rock, kept by a small guard against the banditti who infest those parts, daily robbing and killing passengers, as my Lord Banbury and his company found to their cost a little before. To this guard we gave some money, and so were suffered to pass, which was still on the Appian to the Tres Taberne, whither the brethren came from Rome to meet St Paul, Acts chapter 28. The ruins whereof are yet very fair, resembling the remainder of some considerable edifice, as may be judged by the vast stones and fairness of the arched work. The country environing this passage is hilly but rich. On the right hand stretches an ample plain, being the Pomptini Campi. We repose this night in a Piperno, in the post-house without the town, and here I was extremely troubled with a sore hand, which now began to fester, from a mischance at Rome, upon my base unlucky, stiff-necked, trotting, carrion mule, which are the most wretched beasts in the world. In this town was the poet Virgil's Camilla born. The day following we were fain to hire a strong convoy of about thirty firelocks to guard us through the cork woods, much infested with the banditti, as far as Foster Nuova, where was the Forum Appii and now stands a church with a great monastery, the place where Thomas Aquinas both studied and lies buried. Here we all alighted and were most courteously received by the monks, who showed us many relics of their learned saint, and at the high altar the print forsooth of the mule's hoof which he caused to kneel before the host. The church is old, built after the Gothic manner, but the place is very agreeably melancholy. After this, pursuing the same noble Appian way, which we had before left a little, we found it to stretch from Capua to Rome itself, and afterward as far as Brundusium. It was built by that famous consul, twenty-five feet broad, 
every twelve feet something ascending for the ease and firmer footing of horse and man. Both the sides are also a little raised for those who travel on foot. The whole is paved with a kind of beech stone, and, as I said, ever and anon adorned with some old ruin, sepulchre, or broken statue. In one of these monuments, Pancirolus tells us that in the time of Paul the Third, there was found the body of a young lady swimming in a kind of bath of precious oil or liquor, fresh and entire as if she had been living, neither her face discoloured nor her hair disordered. At her feet burnt a lamp, which suddenly expired at the opening of the vault, having flamed, as was computed, now one thousand five hundred years, by the conjecture that she was Tuliola, the daughter of Cicero, whose body was thus found, and as the inscription testified. We dined this day at Terracina, heretofore the famous Anxa, which stands upon a very eminent promontory, the Sicheon by name. While meat was preparing, I went up into the town and viewed the fair remainders of Jupiter's temple, now converted into a church, adorned with most stately columns. Its architecture has been excellent, as may be deduced from the goodly cornices, mouldings and huge white marbles of which it is built. Before the portico stands a pillar thus inscribed, in Cleta Gothorum Regis Monumenta Vetusta Anxuri Hoc Oculus Exposueru Loco, for it seems Theodoric drained their masses. On another more ancient, Imp Cesar Divi Nervie Filius Nerva, Trojanus Aug Germanicus Darkicus, Pontiff Max Trib Pop XV one 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 Imp six Cos V P P X V one 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 Silicis Sua Pecunia Stravit, meaning doubtless some part of the Via Appia, then Tit Upio Aug Optato Pontano Procuratori et Profect Classis T Julius T Fab Optatus et Tu Via. Here is likewise a columnar miliaria with something engraven on it but I could not stay to consider it. Coming down again, I went toward the seaside to contemplate that stupendous strange rock and promontory, cleft by hand, I suppose for the better passage. Within this is a Circean cave, which I went into a good way. It makes a dreadful noise by reason of the roaring and impetus waves continually assaulting the beach, and that in an unusual manner. At the top, and an excessive height, stands an old and very great castle. Fondi. We arrived this night at Fondi, a most dangerous passage for robbing, and so we passed by Galba's villa, and anon entered the kingdom of Naples, where at the gate this epigraph saluted us, Hospes, hic sunt fines regni Neapolitani, si amicus ad venis, Pacciate omnia invenies, et malis moribus pulsis bonus leges. The Via Repia is here a noble prospect, having before considered how it was carried through vast mountains of rocks for many miles by most stupendous labour. Here it is infinitely pleasant, beset with sepulchres and antiquities full of sweet shrubs in the environing hedges. At Fondi we had oranges and citrons for nothing, the trees growing in every corner, charred with fruit. 29th January 1645 We described Mount Sicubus, famous for the generous wine it heretofore produced, and so rode onward the Appian Way, beset with myrtles, lentiscuses, bays, pomegranates, and whole groves of orange trees, and most delicious shrubs, till we came to Formiana, Formiae, where they showed us Cicero's tomb, standing in an olive grove, now a rude heap of stones without form or beauty, for here that incomparable orator was murdered. I shall never forget how exceedingly I was delighted with the sweetness of this passage, the sepulchre mixed among all sorts of verdure. Besides being now come within sight of the noble city, Cayeta, Cayeta, which gives a surprising prospect along the Tyrrhenus Sea. 
in manner of a theatre. And here we beheld that strangely cleft rock, a frightful spectacle, which they say happened upon the passion of our blessed Saviour. But the haste of our Procaccio did not suffer us to dwell so long on these objects, and the many antiquities of this town as we desired. At Formai we saw Cicero's Grot, dining at Mola, and passing Sinuessa, Garigliano, once the city Minton, and beheld the ruins of that vast amphitheatre and aqueduct yet standing. The river Lyris, which bounded the old Latium, Falernus, or Mons Massacus, celebrated for its wine, now named Garro. And this night we lodged at a little village called Santa Gatta, in the Falernian fields near to Arunca and Sessa. The next day, having passed the river Vulturnus, we come by the Torre de Franciolisi, where Hannibal, in danger from Fabius Maximus, escaped by debauching his enemies. And so at last we entered the most pleasant plains of Campania, now called Terra di Lavoro. In very truth, I think, the most fertile spot that ever the sun shone upon. Here we saw the slender ruins of the once mighty Capua, contending at once both with Rome and Carthage for splendour and empire, now nothing but a heap of rubbish, except showing some vestige of its former magnificence in pieces of temples, arches, theatres, columns, ports, vaults, colosses, etc., confounded together by the barbarous Goths and Longobards. There is, however, a new city, nearer to the road, by two miles, fairly raised out of these heaps. The passage from this town to Naples, which is about ten or twelve English post miles, is as straight as a line, of great breadth, fuller of travellers than I remember any of our greatest and most frequented roads near London. But what is extremely pleasing is the great fertility of the field, planted with fruit trees whose bowls are serpented with excellent vines and they so exuberant that it is commonly reported one vine will load five mules with its grapes what adds much to the pleasure of the sight is that the vines climbing to the summit of the trees reach in festoons and fruitages from one tree to another planted at exact distances forming a more delightful picture than painting can describe. Here grow rice, canes for sugar, olives, pomegranates, mulberries, citrons, oranges, figs and other sorts of rare fruits. About the middle of the way is the town of Ersa, where there came three or four coaches to meet our lady travellers, of whom we now took leave, having been very merry, by the way, with them and the Capitano their gallant. Naples, 31st January 1645. About noon we entered the city of Naples, alighting at the Three Kings, where we found the most plentiful fare all the time we were in Naples. Provisions are wonderfully cheap. We seldom sat down to fewer than 18 or 20 dishes of exquisite meat and fruits. The morrow after our arrival, in the afternoon, we hired a coach to carry us about the town. First we went to the castle of St. Elmo, built on a very high rock, whence we had an entire prospect of the whole city, which lies in shape of a theatre upon the sea brink, with all the circumjacent islands, as far as Capri, famous for the debauched recesses of Tiberius. This fort is the bridle of the whole city, and was well stored and garrisoned with native Spaniards. The strangeness of the precipice and rareness of the prospect of so many magnificent and stately palaces, churches and monasteries with the arsenal, the Mole and Mount Vesuvius in the distance, all in full command of the eye, make it one of the richest landscapes in the world. Hence we descended to another strong castle called Il Castello Nuovo, which protects the shore, but they would by no entreaty permit us to go in. The outward defence seems to consist but in four towers, very high, and an exceeding deep graph with thick walls. Opposite to this is the Tower of St. Vincent, which is also very strong. 
Then we went to the very noble palace of the Viceroy, partly old and part of a newer work, but we did not stay long here. Toward the evening we took the air upon the Mole, a street on the rampart or bank, raised in the sea for security of their galleys in port, built as that of Genoa. Here I observed a rich fountain in the middle of the piazza, and adorned with diverse rare statues of copper, representing the sirens or deities of the Parthenope, spouting large streams of water into an ample shell, all of cast metal and of great cost. This stands at the entrance of the Mole, where we met many of the nobility, both on horseback and in their coaches, to take the fresco from the sea, as the manner is, it being in the most advantageous quarter for good air, delight and prospect. Here we saw diverse goodly horses, who handsomely become their riders, the Neapolitan gentlemen. This mole is about five hundred paces in length, and paved with a square hewn stone. From the mole we ascend to a church of great antiquity, formerly sacred to Castor and Pollux, as the Greek letters carved on the architrave and the busts of their two statues testify. It is now converted into a stately oratory by the Teatines. The cathedral is a most magnificent pile, and except St. Peter's in Rome, Naples exceeds all cities for stately churches and monasteries. We were told that this day the blood of San Juanarius and his head should be exposed, and so we found it, but obtained not to see the miracle of the boiling of this blood. The next we went to see was St. Peter's, richly adorned, the chapel especially, where that apostle said Mass, as is testified on the wall. After dinner we went to St. Dominic, where they showed us the crucifix that is reported to have said these words to St. Thomas, Bene de me scrapsisti toma. Hence to the Padre Oliventani, famous for the monument of the learned Alexander of Alexandro. We proceeded the next day to visit the church of Santa Maria Maggiore, where we spent much time in surveying the chapel of Johann Jovanus Pontanus, and in the several and excellent sentences and epitaphs on himself, wife, children and friends, full of rare wit and worthy of recording, as we find them in several writers. In the same chapel is shown an arm of Titus Livius, with this epigraph, Titi Livi Brachium, Quod Antonio Panormita, A Pata Venus Empitravit, Jo Jovanus Pontanus, Multus Post Annos, Hoc in Loco Ponendum Curavit. Climbing a steep hill, we came to the monastery and church of the Carthusians, from whence is a most goodly prospect toward the sea and city, the one full of galleys and ships, the other of stately palaces, churches, monasteries, castles, gardens, delicious fields and meadows. Mount Vesuvius smoking, the promontory of Minerva and Misenum, Capri, Procita, Lycia, Pausilipum, Puteoli and the rest, doubtless one of the most divertissant and considerable vistas in the world. The church is most elegantly built, the very pavements of the common cloister being all laid with variously polished marbles, richly figured. They showed us a massy cross of silver, much celebrated for the workmanship and carving, and said to have been fourteen years in perfecting. The choir also is of rare art, but above all to be admired is the yet unfinished church of the Jesuits, certainly, if accomplished, not to be equalled in Europe. Hence we pass by the Palazzo Carafi, full of ancient and very noble statues, also the Palace of the Orsini. The next day we did little but visit some friends, English merchants, resident for their negotiation. Only this morning, at the Viceroy's Cavalleritza, I saw the noblest horses that I had ever beheld, one of his sons riding the menage, with that address and dexterity as I had never seen anything approach it. 4th February 1645 We were invited to the collection of exotic rarities in the Museum of Ferdinando Imperati, a Neapolitan nobleman, 
and one of the most observable palaces in the city, the repository of incomparable rarities. Among the natural herbals most remarkable was the Byssus marina and Pinna marina, the male and female chameleon, an onocrotatus, an extraordinary great crocodile, some of the orcade zanates, held here for a great rarity, likewise a salamander, the male and female manucordiata, the male having a hollow in the back in which it is reported the female both lays and hatches her eggs, the mandragoras of both sexes, papyrus, made of several reeds and some of silk, tables of the rinds of trees written with japonic characters, another of the branches of palm, many Indian fruits, a crystal that had a quantity of uncongealed water within its cavity, a petrified fisher's net, diverse sorts of tarantulas, being a monstrous spider with lark-like claws and somewhat bigger. 5th February 1645 This day we beheld the Vice-King's procession, which was very splendid for the relics, banners and music that accompanied the Blessed Sacrament. The ceremony took up most of the morning. 6th February 1645 We went by coach to take the air and see the diversions or rather madness of the carnival. The courtesans, who swarm in this city to the numbers we are told of 30,000, registered and paying a tax to the state, flinging eggs of sweet water into our coach as we pass by the houses and windows. Indeed, the town is so pestered with these cattle that there needs no small mortification to preserve from their enchantment while they display all their natural and artificial beauty, play, sing, feign compliment, and by a thousand studied devices seek to inveigle foolish young men. End of section 15